AOSD challenge. AOSD, watch me bring it out. Assembly sound doctrine. AOSD, watch me bring it out. You know the script, you know the script. So what they saying? What they saying? You brought her with you. Now you're playing. Now you're playing. I ain't playing with your no plans. Script just watch the land. I'm powering up a higher God like super science. Solo, kill a whole doctor with three bulls From the Christians to the Hebrews They're all lost like Nemo When they give them a shot like a free throw Break them all down like a peephole Take some notes from the lesson gain And I didn't get the rest of the spirit In the kingdom that's a keyhole Oh no, I know It's been fulfilled and all know The kingdom is here, I'm like so Underneath we might know Come learn with me This new covenant living The kingdom within Love with all of God's children Watch me break some truth, brain works of good fruits Hebrew literature, ripped off just like saber tooth I'm gonna let it loose from the past over to the feast of boo From the law of Moses, from head to toes, it's a new creation, everything is new A-O-S-D, 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 a similar sound doctrine Yes, one away from reaching my 300 mark. So if you have not, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. A-O-S-D-C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R. And we also have RPK in your search bar. Uh, you can type in, I don't know why that's in there. You can type in RPK, that's Resurrection, Prophecy, and Kingdom right there. Click on it. Make sure you do the same thing. Subscribe, like, comment, share, and etc. And then you can also type in SF Wisdom. Do the same things. Click on it. Subscribe, like, share, comment, hit the bell. And uh, that's my brother Mike Page. RPK is the university we all at, where we're all instructors at. And then you go, you go to my mentors page. All uh, Things Fulfilled with Mr. Dr. William Bell. Click on it. Do the same thing. Like, uh, comment, subscribe, share, hit the bell, and etc. And if you got time to look at the websites, which I need to write more on now, you can go to www.thefirstchurch. Let's see. Uh, Thefirstchurch.live. on it and that's not it right there oh maybe let me try it again www.thefirstchurch.live that's it right there and you can accept it and you can see uh, the book right there we have on PDF the Circumcision of Un and Uncircumcision of Genesis 1, Mysteries of the Garden Revealed, written by our brother Michael Israel and myself, Elvin Israel. We got the PDF available on the website for $14.99. The low price of $14.99. The book is very helpful indeed. Uh, it sheds a lot of light on biblical things. Now, if you guys are like me, and you like hard copies, right? Let's see if we can come here. Hopefully, uh, there. We actually have, where I'm at right there. We have the hard copy right now available on Amazon. Right there. Uh, uh, sorry about that. My, light, my screen ain't going to let me show it. But anyway, the circumcision and uncircumcision, that's wild. 
the circumcision and the uncircumcision of Genesis 1, Mysteries of the Garden Revealed. We have the paperback book, over a hundred and something odd pages that you guys full of information to help you understand what the Bible is really saying. You know, we got a lot of people that look at the carnal things of the Bible and they will tell you all the carnality behind it. But what it actually really means, get the book. It's available on Amazon for you all. All right, uh, I think I have everyone here. Let's let's get ready to go to Clubhouse. I haven't been on Clubhouse in a long time. All praise to the Most High. You know, I apologize for that. Let's see if I know how to do it. Studio. Okay, that's not it. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let me play this on. All righty. I think. Let's see here. I should be okay now. I don't know. All right, now I should be okay. Yeah, there we go. Clubhouse, I am here. Uh, if you guys haven't heard already, because I know you didn't. Uh, the book is finally out, The Circumcision and Uncircumcision of Genesis 1, Mysteries of the Garden Revealed, written by Brother Michael Israel and myself, Evan Israel. Uh, very much, very much intriguing information to help you understand exactly what the Bible is talking about from an ancient Hebrew perspective instead of the modern Western perspective that we get. Um, now, what we're going to do today we're going to touch on really pretty much Psalms 110, but we're going to use some of the ancient Hebraic literature left over in the first century uh, BC era all the way up into the uh, third century AD era, uh, looking at the uh, how those Hellenized Jews looked at scripture compared to how we look at it today in America. Now, this one thing about this term, this Hellenism and all of that stuff, understand when, if we're going to do it like that, try to demonize a culture just because of the rulers they was under, uh, they was under the Hellenes or the Greeks, so now anybody up in that era consider Hellenized, we could do that anything. We can do that for anything. If that's the, if that's the case, the, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, they would have been Egyptianized. And then when they came out of Babylon, they would have been Babylonianized. <laughs> and when they came out of the, the Hellenes or the Greeks, they would have been Hellenized. And then uh, Greek pretty much part of their Hellenism, Hellenistic system. But then even today, uh, dealing with scriptures, when someone bring it out, would it not be Americanized? So we're not going to be concentrating on those um, those um, um, descriptions of the people of the ruling class at the time. Uh, we're just going to look at the literature left over by the Jews, right? And how they exegeted their own scripture. The father chose the word to come under the Hellenized uh, system or the Hellenized rulership or culture for a reason. Uh, as you could tell, as time progressed in history, uh, they started to learn more and more. I want to be more and more... Uh, learning wise dealing with, with, with education wise they wanted to know deeper meanings to everything so he came pretty much at a perfect time when they was trying to expound on what the words mean and what was the energy behind the words and the underlying messages of those uh poems and, and things left over in the culture you know they did that with plato and socrates and all of that but they could actually also be done the same a rule of thumbs could be done with the prophets and, and Moses also the law. So, uh, that being said, let's give a, a disclaimer, right? First thing first, I want to deal with um, how the Lord actually, you know, the Bible set up, it has certain principles. But I want to deal with how people should actually look at the Bible, right? How it should actually be looked at. So, 
understand that the Lord, he creates, or he created something visual from the invisible. So the visible things, the carnal things you see with your eyes, it was created from the invisible, right? But then there's something else you have to understand. And then once he create the visible from the invisible, he then draws spiritual ideals from the visual, the visual or the carnal. Um, this is what pretty much Swedenberg called correspondence. Uh, and I like the way that he explained it. When nature uh, actually tells or teaches a spiritual meaning, like for instance, uh, you go to a metamorphosis dealing with a with a caterpillar to a butterfly. How the dead, how the body dies and a new body comes up, a glorious body. It, it goes from a worm to a butterfly, beautiful bu a butterfly able to fly, and etc. Uh, that's a corresponding on how uh, resurrection actually works. So something visual, something visual created, something carnal created from the invisible, which was a, a caterpillar, right? And then you see the caterpillar go through the metamorphosis. It turns into a, it goes into the cocoon state, which could be considered the grave. And then it comes up into a new being, a butterfly, uh, which is the new state. So that is pretty much how the entire Bible works out. It started off uh, something created from the invisible, made visible, made for everyone to be able to see and interact with. And then using that same uh, 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 object, whatever it is, using that same object, material, or whatnot, the Bible then draws spiritual ideals from it. So he'll let you, the Father let you experience it first so you can know all about it, right? For instance, um, I have a remote control, right? Remote control we know that it's used to control the television. But once you find out the functions of the, the remote control, you then can draw several different ideas from it. No matter if we're talking about frequency, no matter if we're talking about shape, color, uh, functionality, and etc. So many things could be drawn from um, knowing how what a remote is and how it functions. And the father does that throughout the Bible. He uses the carnal, the visual first. And then once you have knowledge of the visual, then he used that same uh, a visual, visual uh, aid to give us spiritual um, knowledge, spiritual revelations. The Father's spirit, those who worship him must worship him in spirit. He speaks through the spirit. Everything that he does is dealing with the spiritual, right? So that's one thing when we're talking about the Bible. So that's why you can have a, a, a physical Jerusalem and a spiritual Jerusalem. A physical Zion, spiritual Zion. Physical Israel, spiritual Israel. Uh, physical Messiah, spiritual Messiah. And you can keep going on. Spiritual, I mean, physical Egypt, spiritual Egypt. Physical Sodom and Gomorrah, spiritual Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, uh, physical angels, spiritual angels. Physical uh, priests, spiritual priests. And you can go forth and so forth and beyond uh, and so on and all that in order uh, with extracting information uh, using that same method. This is what the Father does. All right, so that's one thing. The second thing you have to understand that the Bible dealing with Israel, right? It starts off with a whole the whole mankind, and we actually end with Israel because Israel was the priesthood determined on earth. They were supposed to be the kingdom, the righteous kingdom of the Lord that was meant to mediate uh, between the Lord and the people. That's what the original plan of the kingdom of priests was supposed to be, right? So. The Bible, only addressing Israel, right? The Bible itself is only addressing Israel and every territory Israel touched, the people of Israel touched. So it's addressing Israel as a nation. 
but every territory that the Israelites went into and was affiliated with, that's what the Bible is touching. So if Israel went into, uh, if some of Shem, who were Israelites, went into Japheth uh, land, then Japheth would be a part of the Bible also because uh, Israel was now became affiliated with Japheth, right? Now Japheth is part of the affiliation Israel and so forth and so on dealing with Ham also Canaan and all of that stuff Egypt is dealing with Israel but anything affiliated with Israel get brought up in the midst also so this is how the Bible could be only addressing certain territories only certain land masses any land mass that ancient Israel went inside any land mass that ancient Israel was affiliated with that's what the Bible is addressing, not the whole entire planet. This is why the whole Western Hemisphere or wherever we at, this is why we're not found in the Bible. Because at the time period that it was covering, dealing with Egypt, I mean dealing with Israel, that time period that it was covering, dealing with Israel, and every place Israel was affiliated with, the Americas did not touch that. No one touched it outside of those land masses that the Bible actually speaks of. And you can find it in Acts chapter 2. All right, so now, let's get ready to get started. I think I didn't, I didn't say it so much right there. We can actually get this boat started now. Let's see here. One set to get this bad boy going on. One set. All right, we're finna rock and roll now. First of all, I'm going to go to the 12 patriarchs. And let's see if we can find a quick search, uh, any information on the 12 patriarchs. I see now I have a little delay. I don't like the little delay. All right, 12 Patriarchs, let's see here. Uh, I guess we go to Wikipedia, right? The, 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 the Testaments were written in Hebrew or Greek and reached their final form in the second century CE. All right, so we got it all the way up into the second century CE, and then, you know, eventually they have forgeries and et cetera. Uh, you can go read it yourself. And I think my Patriot, let me see. I got the book right here on me, the hard copy. And I think it says something like, uh, they're talking about different, The testaments of the, uh, here we go right here. Here you can see that I got the book right here. It says, uh, the testaments of the 12 patriarchs were written in Hebrew in the latter years of John Hyrcanus in all probability after his final victory over the Syrian power and before his breach with the Pharisees. In other words, between 109 and 106 B.C. All righty. So let's see how they exegeted scriptures. Uh, those Jews. We're going to look at Simeon right now. So we're going to go through Simeon and we're going to see how uh, Simeon exegeted scriptures. And we're going to show you how pretty much, I only even know it's going to be an exegesis, but we're going to go through how 
all of these writings are touching the same exact thing, but they're saying it different ways. So you got to be well versed in Torah. You have to be well versed in uh, the prophets in order to get what's going on. So this is the 12 patriarchs. Uh, this is dealing with Simeon. It says, Behold, I have told you all things that I may be acquitted of your sin. Now, if ye remove from you your envy and all stiff nakedness, as a rose shall my bones flourish in Israel, and as a lily my flesh in Jacob, and my odor shall be as the odor of Libanus, a Libanus, and as cedar shall holy ones be multiplied from me forever. And their branches, sorry about that, y'all. I guess I can put that up. And their branches shall stretch afar off. Now, this is where I want to really, really get into right here. Now, this is the language that a lot of people get lost at. All of the Bible, dealing with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit inspired, wisdom, wisdom inspired literature. Not for the carnal mind, for the spiritual mind. So, this is what the Holy Spirit supposedly had the uh, creator of the 12 patriarchs to write and we're going to actually see some of it in the Bible too but when you see a lot of warfare and killing coming from the Holy Spirit uh, in vision form and etc understand it's a lot of wisdom that goes behind what is being said remember I stated earlier the Lord uh, created the the visual from the invisible, right? He created the carnal realm from the spiritual realm. So once you experience something in the carnal realm, which we have reality, the Lord then can use that same object in order to explain something spiritual. So, for instance, dealing with war. If you go through a physical war, and we know, uh, reading the Bible, they was all about warfare. So look at the kings. Go through the kings. See how much warfare they did, especially David. David did. He killed so much, he couldn't even build. The Lord wouldn't even let him build uh, the temple. So much blood was on his hand. So, they were, they was a warring faction people in the old days. So, the Holy Spirit used things that they can relate to, which was warfare sometimes, in order to uh, expound on spiritual revelations. So, let's look at it right here. This is three. Then shall perish the seed of Canaan, and a remnant shall not be unto Amalek, and all the Cappadocians shall perish. And all the Hittites shall be utterly destroyed. Right? So we have all of the killing right there. And three, we got um, the seed of Canaan perishing. We got a remnant not being left in Amalek, which means they're being killed. We got all of those from Cappadocia, uh, Cappadocia uh, being destroyed. We got all the Hittites being destroyed. And then we can go to verse 4. Then shall fail the land of Ham. So we got the whole entire land of Ham failing. And all the people shall perish. Then shall all the earth rest from trouble and all the world under heaven from war. So when people with carnal minds, carnality, when they take this, this appears at face value that he's wiping out all of these people. All of those from Ham is being utterly 
destroyed. The so the because we know uh, Canaan was cursed, right? Canaan, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ham's son, Canaan was cursed, uh, dealing with Noah, right? So now we have Simeon speaking on the curse that came upon Canaan. So now the ref, the uh, what the result of that is now. We have the testament of Simeon saying, all of the seed of Canaan going to perish. Uh, from Amalek to Cappadocians to the Hittites, the whole land of Cain, uh, of Ham is going to be, is going to fail. All the people is going to perish. And then when he, when everyone is killed, then the earth is going to be at rest. That's what, they're, that's what they're taking from it at face value. But then, because we know if, if you studied the 12 patriarchs, they also uh, keep taking you back to the book of Enoch. They say this is written in the book of Enoch, that's written in the book of Enoch, and etc. So we're going to go to the book of Enoch, and we're going to look at some uh, similar language, right? So we have all of those, the cursed seed being destroyed, right? So I'm going to read first Enoch 48. I'm going to read... Verse 4, it says, and he shall be a staff to the righteous. Let me, let me make sure I want to read this first. Let me, let me make sure. Yeah, I am. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in a different order, though. Let me show you first. All right, so we have, according to Simeon's testament, all of these individuals was going to be killed. And at face value, it looks like the Lord is wiping off uh, an entire bloodline, the bloodline of Canaan, right? Or a majority of his bloodline. I don't know how many individuals. Uh, he had in his bloodline but this is coming from the seed of Canaan and it seems like the Lord is wiping out a lot of the seed of Canaan at face value but notice after you read the rest verse 4 then shall fail the land of Ham and all the people shall perish see that's it. everybody right there everybody's dying we love it then shall all the earth rest from trouble so now understand right there think about that put that in your mind so after all these people are being destroyed from this cursed line then the earth is resting from trouble and then the next sentence says and all the world under heaven from war so we have a resting of earth from trouble, and then we have the everyone under heaven no longer warring, right? There's no more war. So we're going to show you how this actually works hand in hand with, with the prophets and et cetera, right? This is all biblical of the people they wrote these patriarchs uh, who probably uh, handed down information. Who knows? But the people who wrote these uh, this information had a working knowledge of Torah and the Tanakh. They wasn't just coming up with different ideals and just making up stuff. So we're going to see, uh, first of all, we're going to show you the spiritual inclination, right? So we know that there was physical war. And we, and as I stated, now we're going to show you the spiritual aspect of the visual aid being used. So the visual aid being used is warfare talk and people being destroyed. So that's the visual aid. That's the carnal rendering. So now when you put on your spiritual goggles, like they did in the New Testament after they received the Holy Spirit. They put on their spiritual goggles. Let's see what happened. And then we had Christ 
who actually got the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter, is it uh, four, I believe, when he got the Holy Spirit, able to, uh, then he was able to go out and uh, teach his lesson, teach his words. I think it's four, it's either four or five, but anyway. So let's show you. So we have the earth resting from trouble. Let's show you the spiritual meaning of it, right? We go to Matthew 11, 28 through 29. According to Matthew, Christ's words was, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls so we have the messiah offering rest unto mankind's souls right well first here he was addressing the children of israel but eventually mankind and notice it says that christ is the one that gives the rest so you go into back into dealing with simeon right Back into what Simeon was talking about. Sorry about that, y'all. I don't know why my X split is doing this. I hope it don't shut off. Oh, Lord. There's no pausing though. Uh, so I, I just had a little mount function. Let's see here. Exit. That didn't work. My X split just. I think it's from the crash. Okay, there it go. It's taking me for loops. It's jumping back and forth. All right. I guess I have to work slower. All right. I think we back now. So, here in the 12 Patriarchs, right? It says the earth was going to rest from trouble. After all of the cursed seed was destroyed, then we find out true, truly it's the Lord that gives rest. Now, I'm here to say they're actually saying the same exact thing. One is using parabolic language in order to explain a spiritual revelation the spiritual revelation that when the war that Christ come to uh, came to wage when that war was won him destroying all cursed seeds when the war was won then the earth was able to be at rest but we got to determine what war and what that looked like so now we actually got Christ being the one that puts the earth at rest. Not the destruction of Canaan's physical seed. So now we're going to go to 1 Enoch 48 verse 4. It says, 
he shall be a staff to the righteous and they shall steady themselves and not fall and he shall be the light of the Gentiles and the hope of those who are troubled of heart. So this is actually, uh, if you believe Enoch was written uh, in the, during the time of Enoch, or if it was uh, oral tradition that got passed down into some scribes decided to write it, and we know uh, several fragments of Enoch was found in the uh, Qumran community. And we got it at the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they actually valued the book of Enoch. I don't care what modern Christianity or the Orthodox Church says. The ancient Jews valued Enoch, right? So it was understood back then that this Messiah being was going to come and be a light of the Gentiles. And he was going to be a place of comfort to those who are troubled of heart. And we can see that, I think that's what's that, Isaiah 49. It said he was going to be a light to the Gentiles. Uh, I usually use the KJV. I mean the uh, uh, Greek version. But here I got the KJV right here on me also. And I'm not going to switch between the screens because I did that a while ago. And y'all see that time skip that we went through, right? Like we was in the matrix. Y'all saw the time skip. So I'm not going to do the time skip again because I'm trying to stay right here while I'm at right now. So I believe if it's not Isaiah 49. Um, yes, it is Isaiah 49. I'm going to read it out of the KJV. I, Isaiah 49, verse 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And then you also can compare that. I think that's with Luke. Uh, is it 2? Luke 2, verse uh, 30 through 32, talking about Christ. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. So, for my Israel-only people, if you actually read the book of Enoch, the book of Enoch actually shows you that this was for everybody and not just Israel only. But I know uh, you're not going to believe the ancient Israelites knew what they was talking about. Uh, you're going to believe you know what you're talking about. The modern day American Israelites who uh, pretty much are prideful and believe they know more than anybody on the place, on the planet Earth, no matter what year they was born in. So, uh, But for my other people who, who like truth, uh, here Enoch shows you it's for everybody, right? And he shall be a light of the Gentiles and the hope of those who are troubled of heart. Right? He's the hope of those who are troubled at heart. So they were hoping in the Messiah. So once you read uh, Revelation 7, 17, For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. See, if they're crying, right, they're, they're mourning, right? They're a trouble of heart. They have a trouble of heart. But according to Enoch, those, uh, what it says, and the hope of those. So those without hope, who, who, who gains hope, their hope would be in the Messiah. So when it says that they would not mourn, it's because they received that, that wisdom that the Messiah brought. It's them actually feeding them, and they are no longer mourning. So we have that right there. But let's keep going. And I'm going to read 7 through 10, right? It says, and I want y'all to understand and keep listening to the words wisdom, 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 right? Wisdom. All right, verse 7. And the wisdom of the Lord of spirits have revealed him 
to the holy and righteous, which will be those in the uh, first century first, as well as even all the way us in today, everyone who believed on the Messiah of Israel, and he was who he said he was. But it started off with uh, what Peter first, who you say I am, Peter. You are the uh, living son. You are the son of God. He said flesh and blood has not shown this to you. So we have it here that the wisdom of the Lord of spirits have revealed him, the Messiah, to the holy and righteous. For he had preserved the lot of the righteous. So not everyone, just the lot of the righteous. Because they have hated and rejected this world of unrighteousness. Now, once again, Enoch came out before the New Testament. And we know that the New Testament teaches us not to be lovers of this world, right? Uh, we have that from Paul. We have that in 1 John and etc. And they're actually pulling that information from Torah in Genesis uh, chapter 3, where Eve went through those three loves uh, that of the world, pretty much what the Lord hates, the lust of the eyes, the uh Hold on, hold on. It was the lust of the eyes. I think it's the pride of life and lust of the heart. I think that was it. Oh, let me see here. Lust of the eyes. Let me look it up real fast. That was first John. Was it first John three? If not, we're gonna find it, guys. Uh It's first John two uh fifteen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all of this is in the world. The lust of the flesh I said hard, but I meant flesh. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abided forever. So right here, it said that this lot, I'm just showing you how Enoch, how they used Enoch. It's very much spiritual and it's not as weird as you guys make it be. So they love not the world. They love not the world. Uh, Give me one second. One second. All right. So they love not the world, as we see here in Enoch. For he had preserved a lot of the righteous, because they have hated and rejected this world of unrighteousness, and have hated all its works and ways in the name of the Lord of Spirits. For in his name they are saved. And according to his good pleasure, and it is he who has regard to their life. And in these days, the kings of the earth and the strong who possess the land because of the works of their hand will be shamed because of the day of their anguish and affliction. So are because on the day of their anguish and affliction, they shall not be able to save themselves. And I will give them over into the hand of my elect. Let's read the next one. As straw in the fire, so shall they burn, both for the face of the holy. As lead in the water, shall they sink before the face of the righteous. And no trace of them shall be found any more. Verse 10. And on the day of their affliction... There shall be rest on the earth because the evil ones will be destroyed. And before him, they shall fall down and not rise again. And there shall be no one to take them with his hands and raise them up. For they have denied the Lord of spirits and his anointed 
the name of the Lord of Spirits be blessed. So we see here that once again, the earth is at rest when the wicked is destroyed. But we have Christ, the anointed, saying, come to me, learn of me, and I will give you rest. So, and then we have here in Enoch, that he's judging the wicked, and they are going through destruction. But I want you to notice the destruction. Listen to the language that's dealing with this on their affliction, right? They will fall down and not rise again. There shall be no one to take them with hands and raise them up, for they have denied the Lord of Spirits. So they are losing their authority. No one is able to give them their authority back. They have lost it. And now when their authority is gone, there is rest on the earth. But I want to show you something dealing with Enoch, right? Also, before we get ahead of ourselves, because y'all might get right there. See, my brother? The wicked people are going to get destroyed. It's going to be some death. That's what, that's what Simeon is talking about. That's what we're waiting on. I'm going to go to 1 Enoch 45, verse 1. This is what it says. And this is the second parable concerning those who denied the name of the dwelling of the holy ones and the Lord of Spirit. So Enoch, this is the second what? Parable. So first Enoch 48 is just a continuation of the second parable. See? And then you go to 46. That's just like the vision that he saw in Daniel 7. So if it's a parable in Enoch, it's a vision in Daniel 7. It's all parabolic. And as you keep going on, verse uh, 48, see how it has no breaks. It's one continual flow. This is all a parable. So when these wicked people are being all destroyed from the face, the face of the earth and the land is finally at rest, right? That's what people are waiting on. We find out that if we want to talk about the origin of the language, the way that the Jews used it, they said that that language is parabolic in nature. And if you don't know what a parable is, we're going to go here, definition of a parable in Merriam-Webster Webster Dictionary. A usually short, fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or a religious principle. Also, something such as the news story or a series of real events likened to a parable and providing an instructive example or lesson. So, are you going to say it's actually using real stuff as an example or a lesson, or it's something to give a religious principle. I'm here to say it can actually be both. They're using events that literally happened <coughs> before, and they're writing it down again, but this time for a religious principle. So they're using the understanding of war, war had happened before, so that's the real events. War has really happened in the days of, of Enoch and etc. Really happened, war. But the way that it is written down, it's meant to teach a lesson or a religious principle. Now, that's what I get from it. Now, you might get your own thing from it. But all of this is 
a parable. So, the people being destroyed, all wickedness, right? Leaving. That's parabolic in nature. Parable. Okay? We find out from the New Testament, it is not war that gives the earth rest. It is not people dying that gives the earth rest. But in fact, it is the Messiah that gives the earth rest. So, we're going to find out later on, what's all of this war talk then? What's this all this war talk about? But I'm going to go back into... Let's go back into the Testament, right? It says, And all the people shall perish, then shall all the earth rest from trouble, and all the world under heaven from war. All the world under heaven from war, right? So we got the world resting from war. It's time to find a biblical reality. Let's go to another principle where there's going to be no more war. From the Greek version, translated into English, Isaiah 2 and 4. And he, this is the same Messiah, Right? The same anointed one that Enoch was speaking about. The same Messiah. The same one that Simeon was talking about. Um, and I'm going to show you later on how it is the same one. But notice right here. He shall judge among the nations. And shall rebuke many people. So that's what y'all want right there, right? Y'all think that that's the killing right there, right? He's going out. He's judging them. He's killing people. People are dying. His, his his clothes is soaked in red. Uh, he's coming from Basra with blood dripping from his coat and etc. right? That's what they're waiting on, the warring Messiah, the one that's coming to kill. Notice in, in, in Luke, when he was talking about the, that uh, day dealing with uh, the Jubilee period, notice he left out the part about the vengeance, about the destruction. Because people don't get it. They said, hey, he left it out because it wasn't time. I don't think he left it out because it wasn't time for that. I think he left it out because people was getting the wrong understanding of vengeance from the Lord. What it was, what it actually meant. Did people die? Of course people died. But it was the outcome of another war that was going on. They got caught in the crossfire because their gods, they was following their gods. And their gods got them destroyed. But let's keep going. Isaiah 2 and 4. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. So they want people to die. Hey, hey, killing people, right? But notice what's happening here. When he's judging among the nations and rebuking many people, what is the outcome? And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into sickles. And nation shall not take up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn learn to war anymore. So while the Messiah, see, this is something the Messiah was doing, right? When the Messiah was was here, he was supposed to judge among the nation, and they and they take this for his second coming, right? But I would say it don't matter if it's his second coming or the first coming. Uh, in, in the way that you guys are should look at the scripture because it's the point of the scripture which is they were going to when he got done with his work uh, while he was doing his work they were going to beat their swords into plowshares and spears into, uh, into sickles they weren't going to lift up swords against nation neither was they going to learn to war anymore and people say hey my brother that haven't happened yet People are still warring today. The Bible hasn't been fulfilled. You guys are wrong. 
Why are people still warring today? We're in a war right now, 2022. So how are you going to say that the crisis is teaching people not to war no more if we are still warring and people are still learning to war? Let's continue with scripture. That's the carnality of people. But look, we're going to continue because I'm, I'm going to show you a revelation from a third century Christian. See how he exegeted that scripture. See if I made it up. See, let's see if if someone who studied the uh the, the 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 Bible a little bit more for the deeper revelation. Let's see how they came up with it too. So, but first of all, I want to go to Isaiah nine five and six. Well, uh, I'm going to read sorry six and seven. For unto for a child is born to us, and a son is given to us, whose government that's the kingdom. Is upon his shoulder, and his name is called the messenger of great counsel. So he's a messenger of he he gives great counsel. All of this stuff is going to be important later. The messenger of great counsel. For I will bring peace upon the princes and health to him. Now, what do we find out? What was the uh, fruit for? In Revelation, the healing of the nations. What was the fruit doing in Ezekiel? Healing the the fish, the water, and etc. Bringing life to things that were dead. So here we find out that the peace that the Lord was bringing was providing health to the princes. Now we find out later on that the Lord himself said he was the one that was going to provide rest for the souls. Learn of him. And we find out in Isaiah, this Messiah-like character, he's going to bring peace upon princes and give him health. In verse 7, his government shall be great. And of his peace, there is no end. Notice it's all about peace here. Peace. Now, what do we read in Isaiah 2? They're no longer going to bring up swords against each other. Nation was not going to raise, uh, raise up sword against nation, neither kingdom against kingdom. They was not going to learn about war anymore. That sounds like peace, right? And here in Isaiah 9, we find out that the same character is bringing peace to everyone. And it should be upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to support it with judgment and with righteousness from henceforth and forever the seal of the heart the seal of the lord of hosts shall perf shall perform this and we know the seal is indeed the seal of the lord indeed is the holy spirit right the seal is the holy spirit so the seal the holy spirit of the lord of hosts will be able to perform this will be able to bring forth that peace so, let's keep going. We're going to read Isaiah 66 now. Isaiah 66, 12 through 13. For thus said the Lord, Behold, I turn toward them as a river of peace and as a torrent bringing upon them in a flood the glory of the Gentiles. So we got the Gentiles right there again. Their children shall be born upon the shoulders and comforted on the knees. Did we not uh, learn that the Lord is the one who brings comfort? Is it not what uh, Simeon was addressing? Is that not what Enoch was addressing? The Lord is the one that brings them comfort. Those that's troubled in heart, right? They will be able to rely on the Lord. He's bringing them comfort, right? He's bringing them a river of peace. When everybody else is chaotic in the world, those that believe on the Messiah is at peace. They love not the world anyway, nor are they worried about the worries of the world. They're worried about the Father and pleasing the Father only and pleasing the Son. They're not caring about the world. They are at peace. They believe on Christ. They're not worried about curses and damnation and all dogs go to, he uh, all dogs go to heaven, all that stuff. They're worried about peace, peace, peace. So now, 
And it says, And if his mother shall comfort one, so will I also comfort you. That's the no more mourning. That's the Lord wiping tears from their eyes in Revelation 7. That's the Lord leading them to fountains of living water, which Enoch calls the fountain of wisdom. And he shall, I'm sorry, and I will comfort you, and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. This will be heavenly Jerusalem. Mount Zion, or Zion, however you want to look at it. All right? So now, we're going to look at, just in case you say I'm tripping, Let's look at how the third century Christian origin. Let's see how he looked at this, right? So we're going to go to. This is origin against Celsius. This is uh, chapter 33. Chapter 33. And I'm going to start at, let's see here. Moreover, right here. Give me one sec. One sec. All right, we're going to start at more over. Let me try to make this bigger. All right, right there. He says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came forth from the very Jerusalem. So he's, he's exegeting Isaiah chapter 2, uh, verse 4, or 2, one through four, right? He says more. Remember, this said that this was going to happen in the last days. So even Origen is admitting. I don't know if he is, but he's admitting that uh, what Christ came on the scene, that was the last days. But anyway, moreover, the word of the Lord came forth from that very Jerusalem, that it might be disseminated throughout all places and might judge in the midst of the heathen, selecting those whom it sees to be submissive and rejecting the disobedient. Ain't that, that's what we read in Amos, right? Uh, that's what's in Amos, talking about he's going to take out those uh, from the heathen, uh, that uh, he's going to take out the people from the heathen and uh, let them call upon his name. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what that's coming from, right? Selecting those whom it sees to be submissive and rejecting the disobedient, who are many in number. And to those who inquire of us whence we come, or who is our founder, we reply that we have come agreeably to the counsels of Jesus to cut down our hostile and insolent, wordy, swords into plowshares and to convert into pruning hooks the spears formerly employed in war and now listen to how he says this the exegete this is how that it's understood when it says the lord was going to judge among the nation uh and they was not going to learn war anymore, and they weren't going to lift up wars against nation. This is how he exegeted what that meant. For we no longer take up sword against nation, nor do we learn war anymore, having become children of peace. That's that peace word again children of peace for the sake of Jesus who is our leader instead of those whom our fathers followed among whom we were strangers to the covenant and having received a law for which we give thanks to him that rescued us from the error of our ways saying 
our fathers honored lion idols, and there was not among them one that causes it to rain. So he have it right there that the people that was not lifting up swords, then was the people that was following Christ. The people that wasn't learning war anymore, them are the people following Christ. This is not about everybody. This was just about the people following Christ. Not the whole globe, not the whole land mass, but only the people following Christ. Those children of peace who Christ was the governor and leader over, those children of peace, they were the ones that was no longer at war with each other. Let's keep reading. Our superintendent then and teacher, having come forth from the Jews, regulates the whole world by the word of his teaching. And having made these remarks by way of anticipation, we have refuted as well as we could the untrue statements of Celsus by subjoining the appropriate answer. So even there we have the no more war spoken of. Let's go back there. And by Simeon and the 12 patriarchs when they wrote this. And all the world under heaven will rest from war. We find out that this is only the people who follows the Messiah. So, the war, it's a war being fought, right? People, we got a perishing of a bloodline, right? And then when that happens, the earth becomes at rest, and then there's no more war. This is, start, this is starting to look a lot spiritual, isn't it? This is starting to look a lot like the gospel spreading instead of people killing people and etc. But we're going to keep reading, right? We're going to formulate all of this stuff. So we're going to go back to the 12 patriarchs and we're going to read verse 5 now. Then the mighty one of Israel shall glorify Shem for the Lord God shall appear on earth and himself save men. So if you go into the 12 patriarchs, right? And if you believe it was written when, when the scholars say, then you have to understand that they actually believe the Messiah was the Lord God. And that's not too hard to believe because in John 1, we have John calling the word God that was with God. In Hebrews, we got the author of Hebrews quoting, uh, therefore God, thy God has anointed thee, making Christ be the first God and making Christ's God, which is his father, anoint him. So we got the author of Hebrews also making Christ be God. And then we got Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. When he was speaking on the two Adams. When he said, the second Adam is the Lord from heaven. So we even got Paul. And then he also says it in Colossians and etc. But we got the New Testament all saying that. Christ himself indeed was the Lord from heaven. And then you got you can go into the Targums. It said the memra or the word was presented as the Lord toward Israel from the Father. So we have it plenty of different ways. It's all on my channel if you guys don't believe it. Uh, but anyway, so we got for the Lord God shall appear on earth and himself save men. And just in case you guys don't know what that is, we're going to the Peshitta, Aramaic version, rendered into English. This is what the Peshitta says in Luke 2, 
verse 11. So this is Matthew right here. Let's go to Luke 2. Right here. This is the Peshitta. You see it says right here. Uh, the original Aramaic New Testament in plain English. And it gives you all of the... Um, uh, what's the word? Notes and, and etc. How it works. So you got all the side notes and all of that stuff. But here, we're going to go to Luke 2.11 and read it. I guess we can read it out. Of, I'm going to read it out of the KJV out loud. Then I'm going to read it out of the Peshit or the Aramaic version. So this is the Greek, this is came from the Greek version, Luke 2 and 11, from the Greek version rendered into English. In the KJV, it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And from the Aramaic version rendered into English, it says, For today the Savior has been born to you, who is the Lord Jehovah, the Messiah, in the city of David. So right here, uh, once you have, let me read the note right here. This is the note that it has for that. This is one of the most amazing statements in the gospel and probably the first unequivocal revelation of the deity of Yeshua, uh, Mashikiah. Mara Mashikiah means Yahweh, the Messiah. I have translated Mara as Jehovah in most places since it is more f familiar than Yahweh. There are disputes about the Hebrew pronunciation, but Jehovah still conveys the sense of Yudve Vadve, the, uh, the Hebrew tetragrammaton, four letter names, the Lord God of Israel and of all creation. And you could keep reading it. It says uh, Mara is found over 6,000 times in the Peshitta Old Testament. Translate into Hebrew, Yudved Vadved. Uh, so, uh, blah, blah. Uh, I don't want to blah, blah, but you get what I'm saying. You keep going on. And it said the Greek word used kyrios, meaning Lord or Sir, in a divine or human sense. But here it's translated for today the Savior has been born to you, who is the Lord Jehovah, the Messiah, in the city of David. So we actually have uh, what. Uh, Simeon was said, the Lord shall appear on earth and himself shall save man. We know Christ came to save his people and etc. So this is actually talking about the Messiah. So this is when it actually gets good. Verse 6. Then shall, so we back in the 12 patriarchs. Then shall all the spirits of the seat. Let me make sure that I'm still on. I am. Okay. Then shall all the spirits of deceit be given to be trodden underfoot. And men shall rule over wicked spirits. That's kind of opposite of what happened uh, dealing with Cain, right? When sin was lying at his door and uh, he was going to rule uh, over sin for, um, uh, for the wickedness. Now we got them being able to rule over the wicked spirits for righteousness. But anyway, verse 6, then shall all the, now hopefully I got that right. Y'all can check it out. But then shall all the spirits, now listen to what's happening here. This is more talk. This is warfare talk. Trident, tread, trample, all warfare talk. Then shall all the spirits of deceit be given. To be trodden underfoot, and men shall rule over wicked spirits. So when the Messiah, notice this is the order. Uh, if you, if we're going to say this is in chronological order, first the people were going to be, all these people were going to be destroyed, right, from the wicked uh, lineage or the cursed lineage, and then the Messiah was going to be born. And then he was going to uh, trodden down the wicked, the spirits of deceit, those wicked spirits, and men was going to start being, was going to start ruling over wicked spirits. 
So if it's chron chronological order, <clears throat> this destruction of the seed of Canaan and all that stuff, it had to happen like during the Maccabean era. Because after the Maccabean era, uh, like a couple of hundred years after that, I believe it was a couple of hundred or a hundred, a little over, a little less than 200 maybe, the Messiah was born. So we have here that the mighty one of Israel glorifying Shem, because we know he's the uh, progenitor of, of the Hebrews. And um, let's see here. The spirits of deceits be given to be trodden underfoot and men starting to rule over wicked spirits, right? And we see that being we see that playing out right in real time in the new testament what happened in the new testament luke 10 sorry luke 10 17 through 18 is it no 17 through 19 and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Let me read it again. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I can go to verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. They're written in the book of life. The book of life was in heaven. Their names were written in the book of life. Not only that, notice what he said. They're going to have power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the powers of the enemies. So that meant serpents and scorpions represents the powers of the enemy. So once you go into the book of Revelation, you have that scorpion army comes up. What does the scorpion army represent? power of the enemy you have the serpent that old serpent that dragon coming in what does that represent power of the enemy the devil himself but it says none of these things shall hurt you by any means so when the when the devils became subject through christ it was uh equivalent to satan falling from heaven right it was equivalent to satan falling from heaven now we saw that in simeon's uh what he left to his sons it said that men was going to rule over wicked spirits here what do we have through christ men ruling over wicked spirits they was the devils were in subjection to the followers of Christ. So that meant that the followers of Christ in the first century, they were ruling and reigning. But were they ruling and reigning over people? Or were they ruling and reigning over devils, over wicked spirits? Once again, were they ruling and reigning over people? Or were they ruling and reigning over evil spirits for my people who want uh, someone to kiss their feet let's keep going now okay we're going to keep going let's see why Christ came 1st John 3 8 he that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sent it from the beginning for this purpose the son of man was manifested 
that he might destroy the works of the devil. So if the devil never sinned from the beginning, and if the devil never increased in works, the Son of Man, the Son of God, sorry, would never have been manifested. But since the devil sinned from the beginning, since he increased in works, since he became the ruler of the world, the devil himself, since he did that, what happened? The Son of God was manifested from the heavenly Jerusalem, from the Garden of Eden, where he was hidden at. We can find him in First Genesis by the book. You will see what we're talking about. He became manifested and came down to earth to destroy the works of the devil. It was said parabolically when the followers of the Son of God, the followers of the Lord God, who trusted and believed on him, when they start having evil spirits in subjection to them, when they start having the evil spirits in subjection to them, Christ said, oh, I saw Satan fall down as lightning to the earth. He was losing his authority. And we find out here that Christ came to do that uh, that one feat or to do that feat, which was to destroy the works of Satan. Now, because the works of Satan was affecting everybody, the good and the bad, Christ needed a kingdom. He can't have Satan messing up his kingdom. So he goes in and he does his thing so he can establish his kingdom and how his kingdom can still increase and those not in his kingdom stay outside of his kingdom. But anyway, we see similar language, right? So we got the devils, uh, we got Satan being cast down to the ground when the evil spirits came, became in subjection to Christ's followers. And we found out that Christ came to destroy the works of Satan, right? So, once you go to Zechariah 13, I'm going to start at 1 and 2. Look what it says. In that day, every place shall be open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for removal and for separation. That's the division right there. Verse 2. And it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will utterly destroy the names of the idols from off the land. Idolatry. Anyone wanting anyone wanting to be a god. Remember in Genesis uh, 2, Genesis 3, uh, it was warned about them eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They was tricked, or they wasn't tricked. They went over into their own lust because they wanted wisdom that was going to make them be like God, right? They're on, they became their own idols. They wanted to be self-gods, self-regulating gods. They wanted to have knowledge as God, oh, you will be like gods, knowing good and evil, and it sounded good to them. They wanted to be an idol. Same thing happened in the uh, when we get to the Roman era, where it's at its highest. First of all, you could go into the Bible. You see uh, Nebuchadnezzar try to do the same thing. Uh, he built a statue of himself, and he wanted uh, those to worship the statue as it being him, a representative of him. So we got them uh, under Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> dealing with the idolatry. So then when you get the Romans coming in, uh, now uh, during the Greeks and the Romans, they actually calling themselves gods. Uh, first, they're, they're talking about their Apollos this, and then Antiochus, I think it meant God with us or something. So you got all these Roman emperors who's demanding them do emperor worship as gods. So all of these false idols, these people that's 
uh, puffed up on knowledge, thinking that they have this heavenly knowledge, trying to make themselves be as gods. Uh, all of these the sorcery who who said that they were gods, all of these emperors who said that they was God, all of these false idols, right? Their names was going to be destroyed from off the land, and there shall be no longer any remembrance of them. Think I'm lying? Think that didn't happen? Tell me about those false idols right now. In the comment section, write down all those false idols that you know that was around in the first century. Tell me about all those without without trying to research it and, and study it and, and go into all of these uh, uh, encyclopedias and all of these old library books, right? I'm trying to really dig it, dig deep in it. Tell me about all these emperors that called themselves gods and wanted to be worshipped as gods. Tell me about all these uh, magicians who claim to be gods and, and false prophets. Tell me about all of the idols that they was building with their hands and they was worshiping um, from the time of the Bible in the BC era, era all the way up into the first century era. Tell me about all those in, a, in the comment section. You know why you can't? Because this actually happened. Christ replaced all of this. I can ask you who Jesus is. You can tell me who that is. But you can't tell me about those other idols because he did exactly what he said. I would utterly destroy the names of the idols from off the land and there should be no more remembrance of them. And I would cut off the false prophets and the evil spirit from the land. Is this not what he did? First, he got, um, uh, he started allowing those to follow him to put those evil spirits in subjection. And then later on, we find out he finally destroys all of the evil spirits from the land. So, we're going to go to Romans 16, 20. And listen to what Paul stated when he was talking to the Romans. I guess I can start uh, at 17 through 20 so you can get a little bit uh, of the flow. Now I beseech you brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. So we marking them? It's almost like the mark of the beast, ain't it? A little bit like, let me see what that word is right there. I don't know. Let's see what they Okay, so that's not the stigmas. That's not the other mark. I, okay, then. I think the other one is stigmatis, but it was pretty close. But uh, he said, uh, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I will have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So that's the knowledge of good and evil right there, right? I will have unto you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. That's the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 20. And the God of peace. God of who? Peace. God of who? Peace, God of who? Peace. What is he talking about? Peace. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. What did Paul say? The God of peace was going to bruise Satan under <coughs> the believer's feet shortly now let's go back to the 12 patriarchs so the God of peace was going to bruise Satan under their feet shortly and we read in the patriarch what was going to happen all the spirits of deceit 
be given to be trodden under foot. And men shall rule over wicked spirits. The God of peace will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The spirits of deceit be given to be trodden under foot. Satan, spirits of deceit. Get it? Satan, spirits of deceit will be trodden under your feet shortly. So once again, this is a spiritual battle. This is Satan being destroyed and etc. So we're going to go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Y'all know this is my favorite one, 11Q13, the, Mel the Melchizedekian uh, scroll. And I'm going to read, I'm going to start at, let me see, Elohim stands. Where is it at? Give me one sec. Here, Elohim stands. Let me make sure. Okay, I'm still on. Elohim stands. All right, y'all. One second. These things ain't marked. So, so Elohim stands to your God. All right, right there. So now let me see. I see where I'm going to end it. Let me see here. All right, right here. All right, I found it, y'all. Finally. Sorry about that. Make it a little bit bigger. All right, this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It says, Elohim will stand in the assembly of God. In the midst of the gods, he judges. And about him, he said, and above it to the heights return. God will judge the peoples. As for what he said, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? It's interpretation. So this is how those in the Qumran community, those Zadok priests who had the Old Testaments, not just the Torah, not just the Tanakh, but those other, what they call non-canonical writings, those other testaments, the real ja ja Yasher, Jasher, <coughs> the, uh, the, the complete Enoch, the other uh, testaments uh, of Enos and all of those that's found in the Qumran community. They had all of these in, uh, in, in fullness, right? So, this is how they interpreted these scriptures. It says, its interpretation concerns Belial, he's supposed to be the chief ruler of the evil spirits, and the spirits of his lot. Now, what, did, uh, what was Simeon talking about? Those spirits of deceit being trodden down underfoot and man ruling over wicked spirits right what did christ do he allowed those his followers to put those wicked devils in subjection to them what did paul say that uh the lord the god of peace was finna do bruise satan under the feet of the righteous any day now right so now we find before all of that happened, this is the BC era now, how they was looking at uh, the Psalms, David's writing, and etc., saying what the Messiah was supposed to do. God would judge the peoples. As for what he said, how long would you judge unjustly? I just said that. It says, its interpretation concerns Belial and the spirits of his lots, who, dot, 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 turning aside, from the commandments of God to commit evil. But Melchizedek will carry out the vengeance 
of God's judgment. So now, y'all remember, uh, once you go into um, the the Jubilees, that section in Isaiah speaking on Jubilees. Let's see if I can find it real fast. What is it? Isaiah um, 61, I believe. How long you get, let me get a little water. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord, I'm going to read it from the KJV. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and, to, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that's the year Jubilees, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. And then we got Christ. He stated the same thing in uh, Luke. So now that Melchizedek is Christ. So now we're going to find out. This is the vengeance of God, right? But Melchizedek would carry out the vengeance of God's judgment. And on that day, he will free them from the hand of Belial. And from the hand of of all the spirits of his lot. Now, don't that seem like what Christ was doing? He was freeing people in the first century from the afflictions caused by the devils. Was he not going around uh, casting demons out? So from the hand of all the spirits of Belial, from Satan, he was casting all of those spirits out of people. He was freeing the people from those evil spirits and from the hand of Belial. Not only did he do that, he gave the people, his followers, powers to do the same exact thing. So they were actually going through a spiritual war. They were going through through a spiritual war. Let me say it again. They were actually going through a spiritual war. So let's keep reading. And to his aid shall come all the gods of justice. And he is the one who dot, dot, dot. All the sons of God. And there's a lot of fragments here. This more is the day of peace, the day of peace, the day of what? Peace about which he said, and then fragment, through Isaiah the prophet, who said, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace. We can, You're never going to leave uh, the word uh, peace right there, right? Who announces peace, you're never going to uh, leave peace. It's all about peace. The messenger of good who announces salvation saying to Zion, your God reigns. It's interpretation. The mountains, hold on, no, I'm just going to end it with that one. Your God reigns. Well, I'm going to keep reading. The, it's interpretation. The mountains are the prophets. So just in case you guys don't know, when you go to Isaiah, uh, feet on the mountains, mountain actually means prophets. Hard thing, something visual, mountain. Something carnal, mountain. Uh, the spiritual, uh, uh, the, the spiritual, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, inclination or whatever. But the 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 um the parabolic meaning, the spiritual meaning of mountain is actually prophet. And then we got fragments for all fragments. And the messenger is the anointed of the spirit, as Daniel said about him, until an anointed, a prince, it is seven weeks, and the messenger of good who announces salvation is the one about whom it is written that dot 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 to comfort 
the afflicted its interpretation to instruct them in all the ages of the world in truth then a lot of fragments and it says has turned away from Belial and will return probably into the Lord but that's a lot of fragments in the judgments of God as it is written about him saying to Zion your God rules so we kind of see here well it's not kind of to it here well I'm gonna I'm 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 keep reading Zion is the congregation of all the sons of justice those who established the covenant, those who avoid walking on the path of the people. And your God is dot, 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 Melchizedek, who will free them from the hand of Belial. And as for what he said, you shall blow the horn in all the land. So we see that Melchizedek, which is Christ, was going to free all the people from the hands of Satan, who they call Belial, and Satan's uh, other spirits, those other demonic spirits, and we find out in Zechariah that he was going to actually take all of the spirits out of the land. All of the evil spirits was going to be taken out of the land. Right? So, once you go to the book of Psalms now. Psalms is going to actually have a different meaning now when people are breaking out. Sorry about that. Let's find out. Okay, there we go. Psalms is going to have a different meaning. All right, Psalms 110. I'm going to read 1 through 7. A Psalms of David. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, we have read from Simeon that the what was presented, what was going to be trodden down was actually the evil spirits right the spirits of deceit that was what's going to be trodden down we find out from Paul that the God of peace was going to uh, uh, bruise Satan under the feet of the righteous we read in the uh, 11Q Melchizedek in Dead Sea Scrolls that the Melchizedek in character was going to get rid of the dominion that Belial and his spirits had over the righteous right we read in Zechariah that that Melchizedek in priest that Messiah was going to take all of the wicked spirits out of the land. We find out also in Luke that Christ gave power to his followers over the wicked spirits. So, by knowing all of this information, can we draw the conclusion that maybe it's the evil spirits that's the enemies instead of people maybe the people are used in a parabolic nature to represent the evil spirits maybe when they're talking about a cursed line being destroyed maybe that cursed lineage is symbolic for evil spirits that were going to be destroyed. Let's read. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send out a rod of power for thee out of Sion. 
rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So, is that to say Christ did not have physical enemies? No, it's not saying that. But the problem was the Lord was manifested to do away with the works of the devil. Once again, the Lord was manifested to do away with with the works of the devil. So, when he did away with the works of the devil, those evil spirits no longer had authority, then he can get his people from amongst them and create a nation from them. Well, let's keep going on. The Lord shall send out, of, out a rod of power for thee out of Zion. Ain't that what we kind of read in Isaiah chapter 2? The word of the Lord is going to come from, uh, I mean, a law will come out of Zion. The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And here, Psalms 110, the Lord shall send out a rod of power for thee out of Zion. That would represent the law. The law that Christ brought, dealing with that peace. It says, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And we know that Christ ruled through the gospel. Verse 3, with thee is dominion in the day of thy power. The day of the Lord, we, he has his dominion. He's the one, he's the uh, day six, Adam. The one that gets dominion, right? With thee in dominion in the day of thy power. In the splendors. Of thy saints. What did the saints got on? The saints got on. They're wearing the white garments, right? They are the ones that's shining like the stars in the sky. They are the uh, ones that's around the temple that, that minister to Christ day and night. We find them in Revelation 7, uh, 21. We find them in Isaiah. We find them in Daniel, Hebrews. All of this, right? So he has dominion over the saints, over the earth, but those priests in his presence, those saints, right? So with thee is dominion in the day of thy power, in the splendors of thy saints. I have begotten thee from the womb before the morning. The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand has dashed in pieces kings in the day of his wrath. This, I'm telling you, this is spiritual warfare. Verse 6, he shall judge among the nations. <clears throat> he shall fill up the number of corpses. He shall crush the heads of many on the earth. But we find out that the Lord was going through ruling and judging and righteousness. And he was teaching peace. So if the Lord was judging among the nations, making them put down their swords and, 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 and spears so they no longer lift up uh, swords against each other, them being in peace, how could you take it at face value that he's killing a whole bunch of people? I think as you read, he shall crush the heads of many on the earth. And then we find out that uh, Paul stated how the God of peace was going to crush the head of Satan under the feet of the righteous. Maybe, just maybe, this is spiritual warfare talk. Maybe the number of corpses is those dead to Christ. Maybe... Uh, him judging among the nations. He's filling up the number of corpses. Those are the people that's denying Christ. Those are the people who's given over into the evil spirits who allow the evil spirits to be partake of them because of the sin that they have, allowing them to rule over those spirits and etc. Maybe this is talking about spiritual warfare because priest, the priesthood is about... Uh, being purified. So maybe this is talking about the people that's not purified, right? Let's keep going. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. 
So I what I get from this, this is actually talking about spiritual warfare. When Christ uh, resurrected into uh, the kingdom to sit on the right hand of the power to receive his inheritance, that's his kingly duty. And then him being uh, getting a priesthood, that's his priestly duty. So that's after the order of Melchizedek. And him having dominion in the day of his power and in the splendor of the splendor of his saints, we find out that eventually the Lord and the Father is located inside of mankind, inside of each individual. The temple was inside of people. The, the, the Father is walking inside of people. The Lamb is inside of mankind, inside of man. So, all of these things seem to be dealing with the inward man. It seems to be dealing with spiritual warfare. This is what I'm getting from it. The dominion is through the gospel and etc. The priesthood is through the gospel. Him filling up the corpses. That's those rejecting him being considered dead each person that rejected him another person dies another corpse anybody that denied the gospel anybody denied christ filling up the number of corpses these are people being killed off these are bloodlines being killed off this is spiritual warfare people don't have to literally die uh they will die because they're not under the protection of the father they don't have christ to relent to lean on uh to repent so these people just die they die they die spiritually they die physically right they die uh so that's what i get from that uh this is the defeating of satan when he started crushing the heads of many on earth this is satan being defeated these are other people being killed. These are the armies of Satan being killed, Satan being defeated, because they're no longer under the th authority of the Father. So now, let's get ready to end this thing. So once we go back to Simeon, right? Uh, it says 6. Then shall all the spirits of the seed be given to be trodden underfoot, and men shall rule over wicked spirits. Then, this is verse 7, Then shall I arise in joy. That's resurrection. Then shall I arise in joy, and will bless the Most High because of his marvelous works, because God had taken a body and eaten with men and saved men. So he called God right there. That has to be the Messiah, referring to the Messiah as God, said God has taken the body, eaten with men, and saved men. But why? What's happening here? He's blessing the Most High God because of this. But he's arising. Then shall I arise in joy. When what? Men shall rule over wicked spirits, then shall I arise in joy. So that's the resurrection after men start ruling over wicked spirits. So this is a resurrection motif. The spirits of deceit is being trodden underfoot, right? Becoming footstools, right? Men are ruling over the wicked spirits, right? So that's their rulership, that's their dominion. And now we have the righteous, the dead, arising resurrecting in joy blessing the most high because he came down on earth to eat with mankind and to save them right and we could see this actually kind of being hinted at in first thessalonians 4 13 through 15, but I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. That what was going on in Ezekiel Valley of Dry Bones. Uh, they was dry because they had no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that is the carnal, right? That's the visual. That's what they was visual. 
That's the carnal. He died and rose again. Even so them which also asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's the spiritual. For this, that's, that's what uh, Simeon was waiting on. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Right? So this is the spiritual inclination. But, but remember, Simeon said he wakes up when man start ruling over wicked spirits. Right? So, let's, let's go to, we're going to put all this into perspective, right? So here they're ruling over wicked spirit. Then shall I arise in joy. So we got that from First Thessalonians 4. Those that, that slip was going to arise. And they was going to come back with uh, Christ. So let's go to Enoch. Enoch 51. I want to read 1 through 5. And in those days shall the earth also give back that which was, which has been entrusted to it. So we find that that's what Revelation chapter 20 right here. This is what Simeon was talking about. I would arise up because he was going to be dead at this time. And in those days shall the earth also give back that which was been entrusted to it. And she owe the grave also shall give back that which it has received. And hell shall give back that which it owes. For in those days the elect one shall arise, and he shall choose the righteous and holy from among them, for the day has drawn near that they should be saved. So what you have here, you have salvation, visual salvation, in the corner world that people can see those fleeing into the mountains, people fleeing into the mountains uh, from the Roman army and etc., that's that carnal. That's the visual aid, right? That can be seen. But that represents a spiritual ideal. That represents the spiritual, a spirituality, right? Don't forget, these are all parables. So this represents the spirituality. This represents um well, they go back and forth, right? Uh, what goes on in the in the in the spiritual realm, which is this right here, is seen in the in the physical realm with those uh, written in the book of life fleeing into the mountains. But you can also look at those uh, fleeing into the mountains visually to find out what's happening in the spiritual realm. So they both go hand in hand. They're both parabolic to each other. But let's keep going. And he chose the righteous and holy from among them. For the day has drawn near that they should be saved. And this is also Matthew 25 when he's separating uh, the goats from the sheep. And in those days, the elect one shall sit on his throne. So ain't this Revelation 20? And all, look what he's doing. So he's sitting on his throne. And all the secrets of wisdom and counsel shall pour from his mouth. That's what we read in Isaiah, right? That's that counsel that he did, right? His government, of his government, uh, there's going to be no end. He's the great mighty counselor. So now. All the secrets and wisdom, all the secrets of wisdom and counsel shall pour from his mouth. For the Lord of spirits had given them to him and has glorified him. And in those days shall the mountains leap like rams and the hills shall skip like lambs, uh, satisfied with milk. And the faces of all the angels in heaven shall be lightened up with joy. And the earth shall rejoice and the righteous shall dwell on it. And the elect shall walk on it. So we got something going on in the heavens, and we got something going on on earth. Uh, what's happening in the heaven when the Lord sits down on his throne, the secrets of wisdom and counsel pour from his mouth. And we see uh, this is, uh, well, let, let me show you what that is. So the Lord sits on his throne. The secrets of wisdom and counsel pour from his mouth. And eventually the, angel, the angels in heaven lighten up with joy and the people on the earth rejoice at the same time and the righteous shall dwell on earth. So when something is happening in heaven, something is also happening on earth at the same time. So let's go to
Let's see here. And I didn't even. Uh, 38, 1st Enoch 38, 1. Look with this. The first parable. Uh-oh. So we're still reading parables, right? Something that has spiritual meaning, religious meaning, and etc. Also could be a lesson. When the congregation of the righteous shall appear, and sinners shall be judged for their sins, and shall be driven from the face of the earth, and when the righteous one shall appear before the eyes of the elect righteous ones, whose works are weighed by the Lord of spirits, light shall appear to the righteous and the elect who dwells on the earth. So when, when the congregation comes, that's uh, Matthew 16, 27 through 28. That's Jew 1. That's Enoch 1. The righteous are appearing. Uh, with the righteous one. Uh, this is what Simeon was talking about. Then I will arise and etc. This is happening judgment day. And we found out from First Enoch 51. That when he sets down. To judge. We have wisdom. Pouring out from his mouth. And etc. So now understanding wisdom. Is being produced at this judgment. Right. So let's keep going on. What, who's weighed by the Lord of Spirits. Light shall appear to the righteous and the elect who dwell on the earth. Where will there be the dwelling for sinners? And where will be, where there be a resting place for those who have denied the Lord of Spirits? It had been good for them if they had not been born. So once again, it's a parabolic. Uh, they have no um, protection. They are, law, they, are, they are by themselves. They have no hope. They have no hope on earth. They have no hope in heaven. They, they are hopeless, right? So let's keep going. Verse 3. When the secrets of the righteous shall be revealed and the sinners judged and the godless driven from the presence of the righteous and the elect, what happened? They went into captivity. During that last judgment, Matthew uh, 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, started off at Luke 17. When you deal with that judgment right there, Christ talked about it in Luke 19. You can find it in the book of Revelation and etc. Dealing with that judgment, when the sinners was judged, because once you go to um, the 12 patriarchs, you find out that that final judgment was dealing with Israel. It was about Israel. They wasn't worried about the other nations like that. They was dealing with Israel mainly. Uh, the, the Israelites were in the Dead Sea Scroll community and etc. So now, when the when the righteous shall be revealed and the sinners judged and the godless driven from the presence of the righteous and elect, so uh, the righteous fled into the mountain, the godless went into captivity. From that time, those then this is right here, verse four. This should tell you about your Daniel uh, seven and etc. When the beast was thrown into the lake of fire or thrown into the fire, and then we find out in Revelation the beast was thrown into the lake of fire. And people were like, well, it ain't happened yet. We're still under the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, Enoch actually tells you what that actually means. Verse 4, from that time, after that judgment, from that time, those that possess the earth shall no longer be powerful and mighty. So after that 70 AD, all empires who thought that they was powerful and mighty, they all kept being destroyed. And now most people live like in a republic or in an et cetera. Uh, um, uh, we have all of these, uh, what's, what do they call them? The unions and all of this stuff. Now that people are in, uh, um, no one is, uh, there's really no superpower. They say America's the superpower, but uh, we have allies. So uh, superpower really, really, uh, if we're superpower like that, it's good to have allies, but like in the old days, like Rome and all them, they can go anywhere they wanted to. They ruled the whole earth. Uh, now we have to go through allies. People have to agree to it. They have to vote on it and et cetera. Or war will be declared. So now it says from that time, those that possess the earth shall no longer be powerful and mighty. So he didn't say that the earth was only going to be possessed by 
a righteous people. No, he said after that judgment, the people who possessed the earth. So it still was going to be rulers and stuff, but they was going to no longer be powerful and mighty. There was no Satan to back them up. There was no uh, idolaters to back them up. Their gods that was over them no longer could bless them and back them up. It's over with. Demons had been taken from the land. All evil spirits taken from the land. And look, and they should not be able to look at the face of the Holy Ones because the Lord of Spirits has caused his light to appear on the face of the holy, righteous, and elect. So we're going to find out right here, right? So we see this, 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 this light appearing on them, right? They can't behold the light. They can't look at the light, right? Once you go to Daniel, and all this is in the resurrected state, right? So once you go to Daniel 12, one sec. Once you go to Daniel 12, 2 and 3, and many of them to sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to reproach and everlasting shame. So you got an awaken up out of the dust, just like Adam did. Uh, but down there, some awaken to everlasting life, which is the tree of life, and some are, are, are awaken to everlasting shame, which Adam now did when they ate from the tree of the garden, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and their eyes were awoken their eyes were opened up they awoke to everlasting shame and the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and some of the many righteous as the stars forever and ever so that's the resurrection motif right there so during the time of tribulation during this time the people have been delivered during this time of judgment you got some people uh being shining Awaken to righteous, you got other people being reproachful and being in shame, right? So it never stops. So once we go to, we're going to find out what that means and then we're going to end it. We're going to end the, uh, the lesson. So we go in Oregon or Origin against Celsius again. We're going to go to book uh, five. Chapter 10 this time. And we're going to start with let's see here. Right here. You are the light of the, hold on. You are the light of the world, and let your light so shine before men that they, seeing your good works, may glorify your Father who is in heaven and who possess through practice this brilliant and unfading wisdom or who he or who had secured even the very reflection of everlasting light should be so impressed with the mere visible light of sun, moon, and stars, that on account of that sensible light of theirs, they should deem themselves, although possessed of such a great irrational light of knowledge, a great irrational light of knowledge, and of the true light, and the light of the world, and the light of men, to be somehow inferior to them, and to bow down to them, seeing that they ought be worshipped, ought to be worshipped if they are to receive worship at all not for the sake of the sensible light which is admired by the multitude but because of the rational and true light if indeed the stars of heaven are rational and virtuous beings and have illuminated with the light of knowledge by that wisdom which is the reflection 
of everlasting light. For that sensible light of theirs is the work of the creator of all things, while that rational light is derived perhaps from the principle of free will within them. So we have here, I read that because I want to show y'all that the everlasting light is actually the light of knowledge by wisdom. What did Christ was, Christ was going to pour out? What? When he sat down? Wisdom. He was going to pour out wisdom. When he sat on the throne, he was going to pour out wisdom. We know that this happens during resurrection. During resurrection, what happens? People start shining like light. People start shining like light during the resurrection. What's happening? It represents wisdom. People gain wisdom during that judgment. People gain wisdom in the heavenly realm during the judgment. Yes, you can have wisdom in the heavenly realm. According to Swedenborg, I don't know if you guys believe Swedenborg or not, but I like Swedenborg. But I would say that all these near-death experiences and et cetera also, uh, you can definitely, uh, in Christ, uh, according to Christ, uh, the Father taught him. And everything he did, he learned from the Father. So Christ actually had to be learning in the heavenly realm. So there has to be wisdom given in the heavenly realm. It has to be. Uh, so once again, there has to be learning in the heavenly realm. Because Christ said everything he done, he learned from his Father. So there's learning in the heavenly realm. There's learning on the earthly realm. When the judgment happened, those in the heavenly realm learn, they gain wisdom, and they start uh, reflecting that wisdom like an everlasting light. And those on the earthly realm, when they gain the wisdom through that same judgment, they start uh, being transformed and uh, reflecting the everlasting light also. You can't see it because of the flesh, but it is that indeed. And you keep reading, it tells you about, this is chapter 11, uh, the true light, the light of the Father, uh, virtue, and all that stuff. But we're going to end it with Ecclesiastes. So you go to Ecclesiastes 8. And one, who knows the wise? And who knows the interpretation of a saying? A man's wisdom will lighten his countenance, but a man of shameless countenance will be hated. And once you read out the KJV, who is as who is as the wise man and knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. So we have in both rendering that wisdom makes a person face or countenance shine. So the angels shining in, in their white garment, that's uh, equivalent to them gaining wisdom, right? So once we go through all of this, what we went through, a recap, the Bible is talking about Israel and the places that Israel touched. Now, it's leading up. Now, don't get me wrong. That's the uh, synopsis of it. Now, you got some things that happened before Israel that it could be taken into consideration for the Gentiles. From Adam all the way up into Moses' account, uh, Gentiles can be taken into consideration also. But the point is not about bloodline today because we are reading a fulfilled book. Today, you look at what's what happened back then, and you use that as a guideline for your life today, right? Just like they had faith then, we get faith now, right? Don't, there's no, as we are angels now, sons of God now, there's angels in heaven. And as even though the Lord has taken away the evil spirits from the earth, people has now became the evil spirits themselves. So the wicked people themselves have became the evil spirits. So take remember that. But the Bible, the Lord creates visual aid 
from the invisible and then using that visual aid spiritual ideals are drawn from it so that's how you understand the bible uh, uh psalms 110 him sitting on the right hand of the power making his enemies his footstools and etc i believe that that's all about spiritual warfare that's not talking about uh carnal warfare I believe uh, Simeon and all that, it was all dealing with Enoch and etc. It's all talking about spiritual warfare, which can be reflected upon the corner realm. Uh, check out my video, uh, Like It Is in Heaven as on Earth. Check out that video. It explains more in the detail what I'm getting at, but things happen. But I think these things that we're reading, and what we have read today is concentrating mainly on the spiritual realm. So when you want to tr uh, get some slaves and try people on the foot and rule with a rod of iron and etc., I think this is all about spiritual warfare, not carnal warfare. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Right? So, if you have not, don't forget. Let's go back to me. Purchase the book, The Circumcision and Uncircumcision of Genesis 1, Mysteries of the Garden Revealed. It is a must read and it is found on Amazon. You guys have been wonderful. Thank you all for listening. And this is Elvin Israel from the Assembly of Sound Doctrine and Chandler. So, Sorry that I ain't been able to drop more lessons. Work schedule crazy, but they gave me a little time off, and I said, Lord, let me go on and get this one in, and he blessed me with it. So thank you all. Y'all stay in shalom. Have a good night. Thank you for clicking on the channel. A-O-S-T. Assembly of Sound Doctrine Channel. Assembly of Sound Doctrine. A-O-S-T. R-P-K. Resurrection Prophet Kingdom. Like, subscribe, share, let's go! Oh. Come get a lesson, I'm teaching blessings, no need for guessing, I'm knowledge testing, it's truth time, the wise will shine, and the wicked will pine, I'm a righteous kind, right out of trouble, I'm keeping it subtle, just me and my brothers and sisters, they love us, we're fixing the puzzle, no stressing, I come to the bunk and the struggle with us and cuz, wanna read it, believe it, they should be back, see that, they need it, like a kid back, breaches and pieces, like a kid cat, Aki's and I get seasoned, it's a poly world, not dolly world, Alba love, the kingdom within, A-O-S-D, it's Vanessa, on P-K, let your journey begin, it's a poly world, not dolly world, Alba love, the kingdom within, A-O-S-D, it's Vanessa, on P-K, let your journey begin,